<laughs> Dr. Lorenzo Bellucci from the University of Paris, and uh, he's an eminent specialist and uh, said that I'm a neurology. And in parallel of being a great scientist, he's also a visitor in chief of several children and many years of rescue. And uh, today he will give us a talk uh, concerning death. Accidental cell death is. 
Accidental cell death is a type of cell death which is totally uncontrollable, meaning that um, whenever it, it occurs, it uh, basically reflects the total disassembly of the cells, and there's nothing you can do about it. You cannot modulate it pharmacologically, you cannot modulate it genetically, you just have to look at it and uh, you feel completely useless because there's no intervention that you can uh, employ from your treatment farm. But this is very rare actually. Most of the time the cells die through a, a pathway that is co-regulated because it involves a machinery that you can actually uh, target. You can target with chemical agents and you can target with genetic intervention. Um, I actually, this is a big group of cell death types. If we go uh, a little bit uh, in there, we see another type of cell death that's called programmed cell death. And these two are mechanistically the same. They use the same molecules, but it's conceptual from, from a conceptual point of view. Regulated cell death is a type of cell death that follows stress. So when the cells are stressed, then they try to survive, and when they cannot survive, they will die through this mechanism. Programmed cell death is something that is inbuilt in yourself, in, the, in your genome, and it actually is very important for development at the embryonic stage and for the maintenance of tissue homeostasis. As you surely know, uh, your cells are continually, continuously dying, and they are dying through this mechanism, which is totally physiological. But again, the uh, pathways that are involved are exactly the same. So, to talk about cell death, I would really like to spend a, a, even 10 minutes about the definition of cell death because I'm pretty sure that at least uh, when you look at the literature, there's a big, big misunderstanding out there in the way we are trying to measure cell death. Unfortunately, we cannot see this in the microscope. And also, unfortunately, this is most, most of the time uh, what's happening in the field. So there's somebody measuring something and then this guy already describes it in another way and the crowd take it in a third way. Imagine what happens with, with, when one of these guys goes elsewhere and trying to tell the same story again and again. Um, so, we, I had a chance to be at the center of a committee for defining the, uh, the aspects and the characterization of that for a long time now. And when it, when it goes down to the definition of cell death, so that is very easy. So that is the loss of plasma membrane <coughs> integrity, which is actually super easy to measure in vitro because you can use vital dyes that are taken up by the cells only when they are dead. So you have a very simple measure of cell death that most of the people don't use. They don't use it because then reviewers come around and they say, yeah, you want to see the mechanism, so they start to measure caspase activation, phosphatidylserine exposure, mitochondrial transmembrane potential dissipation, and many others. The point is, yes, those mechanisms, most of the time, are associated with cell death, true, but in many instances, they are not. So when you measure caspase reactivation, you might be measuring cell death or not. So you have first to go to the part of it and measure the uptake of vital dyes. This is very important. It's very important because um, we have been assisting to the misuse of many terms in the literature because of the, of the previous issue. For instance, senescence. Many people think that senescent cell, uh, and I'm talking about cellular senescence, not the senescent, uh, um, the, the way of using the term senescence that is related to aging, as we heard before. That's the real cellular senescence. Most of the people think that senescent cells are dead. And they are actually not dead. They are, they are out there. They are very, very important, especially from the uh, perspective of cancer therapy, because these cells are there and they secrete a lot of cytokines. They secrete a lot of uh, growth factors that uh, the other cancer cells that might not be senescent are using. So I would like to prefer to, to propose this uh, um, definition of cellular senescence as a permanent proliferative arrest that is characterized by a uh, specific biochemical feature, of course, uh, you can measure senescence, you just take the galactosidase assays, there's the secretory phenotype, um, there's a chromatinization that you can measure, and of course it's also um, characterized by specific uh, morphological features like this one. Um, another term that has been misused as a cell death type for a long time, and it is still being misused as a cell death type uh, nowadays, is autophagy. The problem is, People were looking at the microscope and they were seeing the top, uh, cells getting plenty of vacuoles and then they would see the cells die. So in their mind it was like autophagy comes before, death comes after, so autophagy is provoking death. Wrong. 
Most of the time, when you inhibit autophagy, you're actually accelerating cell death, especially in mammals. So it means that autophagy, yes, is there, but is there to try to save the cells, because autophagy is one of those mechanisms that is uh, totally involved in probably most, if not all, uh, type of adaptation to stress. So whenever you stress a cell, this cell probably will undertake an autophagic response, so if you inhibit this autophagic response, the cell is going uh, to die faster. So autophagy can be defined as an, uh, uh, an ancient mechanism of adaptation uh, because its, its presence uh, has been documented back to the East um, and uh, is based, of course, on, on some forms of cellular cannibalism. So we now go back to the original, uh, original formulation. So we have uh, cells that are stressed, they attempt to survive, uh, they cannot survive and they undergo regulated cell death. Okay, what? Turns out that regulated cell death is also a mechanism of homeostasis preservation. Um, and actually, it's very important because in this, uh, in this perspective, so the homeostasis of the whole organism comes uh, before the homeostasis of single cells. So why that? Well, uh, for several reasons. First of all, uh, you don't want your cells, in your body cells that are totally useless. Think about an excessively damaged cell. Uh, this cell probably will not be able to uh, perform the normal task. So it's there, uh, it's eating, uh, and you don't need it, so you don't want it. And think about cells that have a lot of DNA damage or epigenetic damage. You don't want them either, because these cells can turn into uh, a cancer later on. So regulated cell death, from this point of view, is very important because it, get, it gets rid of these cells for you. And then it's also even more important because Regulated cell that can communicate to the rest of the organism a situation of danger. It's like, you still we have a problem here. Uh, how is that? Because cells, when they die, they release a lot of things. And these things include so called damage associated molecular patterns of, or DAMPs. DAMPs are very, very important uh, for many uh, types of disease, inflammatory disease, autoimmune disease, and cancer therapy. Lately, also, for, uh, that's not, it turned out that they are also very important for cancer therapy. So what are DAMPs? DAMPs are endogenous molecules that are in your body already and your immune system normally does not see because they are inside the cells. So your immune system is out there with plenty of receptors. Uh, th those molecules are also out there but they are within the cells so the immune system cannot see them. And when the cells are suffering, they are stressed, they are dying, they release these molecules. So the immune system gets activated and interesting part of it is that the receptors that are used for sensing DAMPs are exactly the same receptors that are used to sense bacteria and viruses. So there is a sort of monitoring of extracellular threat, of danger, and it doesn't matter whether it's a danger coming from a pathogen that is invading our body or whether it's a danger coming from our cell, some of our cells. Um, and the system is the same. So I just mentioned here a bunch of these danger signals, those that are most relevant for the rest of my talk, um, especially ATP. Intracellular ATP is, the, of course, uh, the storage of energy of the cells. Extracellular ATP is a very powerful danger signal. HMG1 is a nuclear protein. Some heat shock proteins and other, and other uh, chaperons of the endoplasmic reticulum as well, like in some cases, uh, some mitochondrial DNA. And the list would be two pages long, probably. Now we have uh, some hundred of dams that have been characterized. So why are dams so important in cancer therapy? Well, we asked this question 10 years ago, uh, even before, but even before I arrived in the lab, and there was this super talented pool to Gwaila Casale. She decided to try to vaccinate mice with dying cells only. So she took cells from, uh, of course, uh, cancer cells, and cancer cells of syngenic origin, so same uh, genetic background. She treated these cells in vitro with uh, doxorubicin, for instance, and then she vaccinated mice with these cells. And then to try to test vaccination, she came back one week later with living cells of the same type. And surprisingly, even in these very preliminary experiments, there was a, a statistically significant difference between the mice who received PBS in the vaccination uh, shot and mice <coughs> that received dying cells in response to doxorubicin. And even more surprising, this was not the case for other chemotherapy. So already back there, we realized that some agents were able to kill the cells in a way that differed from other agents. 
So the, uh, the next question was, is this vaccination effect specific? And to test that, we actually got these mice uh, that, were, that were successfully vaccinated and we re-injected them again with the same cells and none of these mice developed a tumor. But when we injected them with other cells, like uh, mammary adenocarcinoma TSA cells, totally unrelated, of course, still syngenic in the uh, all of them developed a tumor. So it turns out that diet acid cells can trigger an immune response in syngenic host. And those responses are specific from antigen uh, of the vaccinating cells. So what then have to do in all, in, all this, uh, in all this setting? Well, of course, since then we started to characterize uh, the mechanisms that were responsible for this immunogenicity. And we, find, we found out that when you treat uh, tumors with an immunogenic cell that produces like this uh, mitocentrum here, they release ATP. Uh, these mice were having tumors overexpressing an extracellular variant of luciferase. Um, so you can monitor just by the signal, the light signal, the emission of ATP in the microenvironment. And you see here, you treat the mice, control mice with the uh, MTX, and you get a nice signal quantified here. And it turns out this does not happen when the cancer cells lack either of two genes that are involved in autophagy, such as ATG5 and ATG7. So autophagy deficient cancer cells cannot release ATP. Uh, so what? Of course. This is the important part. Look here, the vaccination test. All these cells that had no uh, autophagy proficiency, so all the cells that could not release ATP in response to chemotherapy in vitro could not vaccinate mice in vivo against uh, living cells of the same type. So, yes, cancer cells can trigger an immune response, but they do so just when, when dams are properly uh, emitted by dying cells and when they are properly, properly detected by the immune system. Here, uh, a little bit more visual story, uh, another type of dam uh, receptor interaction we characterized last year. Uh, this has been published in Science. If you look here on this uh, video up there, what you can see is a cancer cell, murine cancer cells dying in vitro in response to oxyurbacy, and those little things coming by are splenocyte from white type mice. So this is a completely white type system. The cancer cell is dying, and the splenocyte go there and interact. Uh, those tracks are actually shown here. So you see, if you center this track on the cancer cells, you see a nice pattern, and the interaction time is shown here. Interestingly, when you actually use uh, splenocyte that like a receptor that's called FPR1 here, splenocytes are coming around but they don't really interact with, with the dying cells. And if you look at the, um, at the track, this is the situation, and if you look at the interaction time, the interaction time is gone. And interaction time is also gone uh, when the cancer cells are lacking annexin A1, which is another dam. So, you need again this system in which a dam, in this case annexin A1, interacts with the receptor, in this case uh, FDA1, to get your splenocyte, your antigen presenting cells, to the dying cancer cells. Is this important? Uh, yeah, if you look here, you will see that in wild type condition, um, so wild type mice bearing wild type cancer cells uh, of syngenic type, you will see that mitochondrial, uh, which is this immunogenic that is, is perfectly efficient. But the efficiency is gone when the tumors lack uh, annexin A1, and it is also gone when the mice lack uh, for real peptide receptor 1. Um, so there, you must have these two partners, and it's also the same uh, for the vaccination effect. So you lose completely the vaccination effect on when mice are lacking FK1 but you don't really care if cancer cells have FP1 or not, so you, you just have a normal vaccination. So we came around with the definition of neurogenic cell death as a type of cell death, a type of regulated cell death, that can trigger an adaptive immune response in syngenic immunocompetent host. And this immune response um, is totally, uh, doesn't absolutely need adjuvants. You don't, it's not a real vaccination system in which you're, you're giving an antigen and you're giving adjuvants. In this case, everything comes from the dying cells, the antigens and the adjuvants. The adjuvants are the dams that are released in the system. And this is kind of a multifactorial system, so we have to characterize, as I mentioned, the release of ATP and the receptors that are required uh, on the uh, antigen-presenting cells for the detection of ATP, 
And we also characterize the release of uh, the release of HMGB1 on the nucleus that is required um, for binding to the TLR4 on antigen presenting cells. Uh, we uh, characterize the exposure here of this uh, ER chamber, which is pyroticulin, on the plasma of that of dying cells. And we lately characterize this uh, type 1 interferon circuitry that uh, really uh, leads to the release of this uh, chemokine that attracts these cells. So, how do you detect uh, immunogenic adaptive uses? Of course, you have two ways. Um, kind of obvious way, of course they need an immune system to work properly, so you can test them in mice that are having tumors, you can test them in a totally immunocompetent setting and an immunodeficient setting, and those immunogenic adaptive users will be optimally uh, efficient only in the presence of an immune system. But this is not the real gold standard experiment, because there are many chemicals that are activating the immune system uh, so they also do, uh, they also have this profile, but they are not killing the cells in an immunogenic fashion. They are just, for instance, depleting T-Rex from the microenvironment, or they are stimulating NK cells. So they also need an immune system, but they don't, they don't induce immunization there. So the only way that you have to, to realize whether your molecule of choice, uh, your preferred agent, is an immunogenic that the user is the vaccination test. So you take cancer cells in vitro, you treat them in vitro with your agent, you clean them of the drugs, then you, you use them to, uh, to inoculate immunocompetent mice. Then one week later, you come in the other flank and you inject living cells at the same time. And if these living cells are not able to form a tumor, then it means that you could vaccinate the mice. If they are able to form a tumor, it means that these cells were dying in a non-immunogenic fashion. Of course, well, there is, I will tell you already from now, there is a big drawback of this system that means that you cannot test human cells uh, in vaccination experiments. For human cells, you have to go for indirect <coughs> measures that are, you take the cells, you kill them, and you expose these cells to uh, the lipid cells, so tolerable and lipid cells, and like, you, you can measure activation markers, but you cannot really, uh, use vaccination experiments, of course. Uh, we are working on generating humanized mice that could allow us to do so, but this is not really the case so far. So, of course, we have this fantastic system in mice, and the question would be who, who the health cares, uh, actually. So, we wanted to know if this is clinically relevant to some extent. And to do so, we went to the archive of IGR. IGR is a big hospital in Paris, and we tried to figure out uh, patients' scores, uh, retrospectively, of course, uh, in which we could test our assumption. And we had this patient cohort, uh, breast carcinoma patient receiving anthracyclines. Anthracyclines are immunogenic adaptive inducers in our system. And look here, when you start five patients based on the uh, P2RX7, which is the receptor for extracellular ATP, or when you start five patients based on TLR4, which is the receptor for extracellular HGV1, you see a nice and statistically uh, significant difference in metastasis pressure biome, meaning that. Yes, this thing is clinically relevant. And the same happens when you actually uh, test this. Uh, this, are, uh, this is another port from the US. Uh, again, breast carcinoma patient treated with anthracyclines, and this, in this case, they were stratified based on the FPR1 genotype. So, patient having non functional FPR1, similar to patient having non functional P2R7 or non functional TLR4, are doing worse when it comes to metastasis free survival, and in this case also overall survival. So, what happens when you don't get all these signals, when, when you don't get all the dams, or when you cannot detect them? Of course, the first thing that, come, uh, that came to our mind <coughs> was, uh, maybe we should try to complement the missing signals. And so we try to do that, and actually it works pretty nice. So when you have agents, for instance, that are unable to uh, induce the autophagy-dependent secretion of ATP, you can actually promote autophagy in these cells, or you can use an inhibitor of extracellular ATP, so you can reduce the degradation of extracellular ATP, and you will be able to complement the defect and restore the immunogenicity of cell death. Same thing when you, have, uh, when you don't have ASMG1 release, uh, you can actually use agonist of this receptor, which is the other four, to complement the fact that your uh, Inducer is not able to promote all the old marks of the immunogenic cycle. So, is this complementation clinically relevant? We also think it is. Because look here, we went again to this, uh, to this archives, and 
At that time, we were interested in cardiac glycosides. Like cardiac glycosides have been used for years for the treatment of arrhythmias, for the treatment of several cardiac conditions. And in our hands, they were not able to trigger a immunogenic cell death alone because they would not be able to kill the cells in a significant manner, but they would be able to promote all the signals that are associated with immunogenic cell death. So they would be really, really good at complementing the immunogenicity of other uh, chemicals like cisplatin, uh, which is not an immunogenic cell death inducer. So we came to the Earth Child and we found people who, by mistake, well, who by misfortune, sorry, had not only cancer, but also had a cardiac glycoside treatable condition. So these patients in this column had cancer, this kind of cancer, and also a heart defect. So they were receiving chemotherapy, and they were also receiving digoxin, which is a, a cardiac glycoside. And these patients here, we generated a pair cohort of patients having just cancer, of course, the same types of cancer, same stage, same uh, distribution of therapy, same sex. So it was really a one to two pair core. And what you expect when you have this kind of cohorts, you expect that the cohorts of people having a heart defect and cancer would die earlier. And it turns out that in our system, it was not the case. In our setting, people having digoxin together with their uh, chemotherapy implying that they were also having an heart defect they were dying later. Meaning that digoxin, but probably meaning that, because of course we couldn't test it in patients, but the, our interpretation of this was that digoxin was boosting the neurogenicity of chemotherapy, so the digoxin would be rendering cancer therapy more effective. To further uh, got insights into that, we divided that core in, in the, of, of course, first of all, for type of cancer, here we had breast carcinoma patients, and, and here we had colorectal carcinoma patients. And we decided to subdivide these people in patients having a non-immunogenic chemotherapy and immunogenic chemotherapy here. And it turns out that digoxin doesn't change at all this is, this is outcome when the chemotherapy is already immunogenic. But it really changes the thing when chemotherapy is not immunogenic, which was a further confirmation uh, that this digoxin and, uh, uh, and this immunogenic, so those immunogenic chemotherapy were working in the same system. Based on this data, we started a prospective clinical trial uh, in which at and exposed cell carcinoma patients are receiving cisplatin-based chemoradiation, which is not immunogenic, so they are receiving it alone because it's a standard procedure, or they are receiving it together with digoxin. And we have now enrolled some 40 patients who so will soon have some results. So, um, let me share with you the, how I feel the, 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 the field is changing. Okay, we have had these treatment stage for a long time and they are still there. Of course, they still use the surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy. But now another player is coming to the field, which is immunotherapy. You might know that during the last four years, three monoclonal antibody targets in the immune system have been approved for use in cancer patients, which has been uh, a total revolution. Um, so now people admit, which was not the case 15 years ago, uh, admit that the immune system can do something on cancer. What we think is another, is a step forward. We think that the chemotherapy and radiotherapy that has been selected until now, because they worked, so there was no such testing in the sense of mechanistic testing. There was just chemicals going to the clinics for some reasons and then they would be kept in the clinic because they worked. So total empirical approach. We think that these chemicals work or this radiation therapy works because they have also activated to some extent the immune system. So of course now the next step is that we combine chemotherapy and immunotherapy or chemotherapy and radiation therapy to really get rid of cancer. How can we do that? Well, there's of course as many ways. One way is just to target a new system. We have, I just mentioned this checkpoint block, where you have those uh, immunostimulatory antibodies, uh, you have inhibitors of IL-1, you have inhibitors of purinergic uh, immunosuppressive receptors, so you have a lot of uh, distinct ways to boost the immunogenicity of your cancer by targeting the new system. The point is, everybody is doing that. So, an alternative way is, why don't we try to target what happens in cancer cells before they die, or, or as they die, to boost the immune response. And actually, when you think about the cancer, it's a very heterogeneous system, so when you, when you treat it with something, it's not really, 
you kind of take it for granted that every, in every sub uh, part of the tumor you get the same response. So you get a mixed response. Some of these responses will be more immunogenic, some will be less immunogenic, so that yes, we feel the balance toward the immunogenic part. So we are currently proposing this new concept which you don't want to alter, you don't want to change how, how many cells you kill with chemotherapy or radiotherapy. You want to change how they die and you want to do it um, so you want to change out the, this type of cell that is perceived by the organism and you want to do it by targeting stress response. So we recently started to work uh, to produce some data that would um, like justify this approach. Okay? And this data has just, has just been accepted for publication in cancer cell. So the idea is, uh, I, I told you this the story of autophagy. Autophagy is responsible for the release of ATP, the first immunogenesis of that. So we thought, okay, let's, let's activate autophagy and see what happens. And the most physiological activators of autophagy is, of course, starvation. So you can start mice up to 48 hours. I will tell you later what happens uh, for, for mice. Here, it was a starvation period of 48 hours, and we just did it in synthetic mice uh, bearing fibrosarcoma. And we combined it with uh, MTX, uh, the immunogenic that inducer, or cytopathy, which is also immunogenic that inducer. And look here, you see at day 27, these two uh, interventions of nutrient deprivation and chemotherapy, they synergize pretty much in, in tumor control. And here we have the curves, here we have the average, and you see there's a pretty significant difference if you take just mitoxantrone alone, you go down. So, this is non use actually. Uh, Balkan Logo demonstrated the same thing in 2010 in a science foundation medicine paper. Okay? But he was proposing that this would be due to the fact that when you start mice, you change growth factor signaling. You don't have any more, well, you have a decrease in insulin growth factor. Uh, signaling and other uh, growth factors that are important for cancer cells. And actually, in our system, this is not true. Because when we, when we take new mice, and those mice are totally proficient in IGF-1, IGF-1 receptor signaling, this thing is totally abolished. No more efficacy from chemotherapy, no more effect from starvation. And we also did that in another model. This is a little bit more physiological model. In this case, we generate breast cancers um, by, first of all, implanting a pallet of, of hormonal pallet in the back of mice, and then we uh, administer uh, carcinogen by uh, oral treatment. You see here, uh, when you combine uh, MTX plus uh, starvation, you have a nice decrease uh, in tumor growth as compared to MTX alone. And also, it also depends on the new system because when you take down uh, CD8 cells, in this case, uh, you see that the tumor is growing the same. This is the same experiment. I just divided the two graphs to avoid uh, to avoid them to be to uh, overlap. <coughs> and you see here the increase in survival that you get uh, with mitoxantrone plus glucose starvation, which is the red curve here, is totally gone when you deplete uh, CD8 cells, but not CD4 cells. So. Starvation. Starvation is uh, feasible in mice. In 24 hours, they lose 10% of the weight. In 48 hours, they lose 25% of the weight. And if you allow them to get food again at 48 hours, at 72 hours, they are back at their weight. So it's really something going fast in mice. But most likely, nobody, uh, not even cancer patients, would like to undergo a similar period of observation, of course. And actually, as you surely know, advanced cancer patients have an issue, it's called cachexia, so they are losing tissues, um, they are losing muscular mass, and they don't, no, no clinician will allow you to starve your patient for a week to get 10% weight loss, if you can get it. So, we found out that there are molecules that are kind of interesting, because they actually do, in cells and in the organism, the same thing that caloric restriction uh, does. So, for instance, they activate autophagy. This is one way to measure autophagy. Uh, as you see here, gluten-free, you have this nice appearance of the uh, lower band of LC3, which is also the case for these various caloric restrictions. And also, they, they reduce the acetylation of uh, intracellular proteins. They uh, also uh, form autophagosomes here with this GFP, uh, GFPS3 marker. But not, not important, you don't have to re uh, recall the details. The idea is we have chemicals that actually can do 
by economically speaking, the same thing that uh, calorie restriction does. So what happened when we co-treat animals uh, with chemotherapy, with neurogenic chemotherapy, and those animals? And you see here, they also do the same like calorie restriction does. Uh, they all actually improve the efficacy of chemotherapy, and those chemicals actually are, some of them are totally like uh, chemical agents, these are, these are inhibitor of acne, uh, these, these two are two inhibitor of ac acne, which is uh, acet, uh, acetyl Um This is those spermidine and resveratrol, so they are kind of uh, natural compound, natural molecules that we have already in our body, uh, spermidine and resveratrol is available in several fruits including grapes and wine, as you should know. So we, we don't have uh, much of a um, safety concerns about these two molecules. And again, I just present one curve here because they would be just the same for the five molecules. When you take down the immune system, when you do the same experiment in your mice, everything is gone. So caloric restriction magnetics also have anti-cancer effects. They synergize with chemotherapy in a way that depends on the immune system. And of course, so the idea was, okay, we activate autophagy to induce ATP secretion and to, uh, to accelerate the efficiency, the efficiency of cancer therapy. So we wanted to be sure that it is really due to this, um, to this secretion. And indeed, when you take down autophagy in cancer cells, or when you use cancer cells that are able to degrade ATP faster because they overexpress CD39 in the extracellular environment, so the effect the cumulative effect of uh, calorie-restriction magnetics and, and chemotherapy are gone. And we went one step further to look what was going on, and actually we found that in this combination only, tumors are infiltrated by much less T-Rex, and T-Rex, as you know, are immunosuppressive cells that counteract the efficiency of chemotherapy. And this is, again, goes away, the, the situation is really the same when you have autophagy-deficient tumor, and when you have tumors that can degrade like extracellular ATP. So the idea is you can boost autophagy, which is an intracellular stress response, to turn your cells, your dying cells, into something more immunogenic. Um, I will skip on these two slides because we're kind of late. Uh, it was just the same, the same across the other way around. So I will go to the conclusion. Of course, so far we have studied cancer uh, in, in rodent models in a very uniform and um, I would then say we are, we are subestimating the complexity of these tumors because for a long time we just had like tumors growing in new mice or no immune system or now we are playing the syngenic system a little bit better but we can't really we are not really um, taking into account the fact that in the tumor microenvironment there's not just cancer cells uh, there's immune cells and cellular cells stromal cells um, there's not just the type of cancer cells. The cancer cells are very heterogeneous. So we have been studying this in a very binary system, for instance, wild type mice and uh, you know, immunodeficient uh, and uh, autophagy deficient tumors. So we want to go one step further and try to render each of these compartments deficient in some uh, uh, stress responses to make it to understand what is the contribution of all these cells. So this is what. Um, I, I think was cancer therapy before, uh, like 20 years ago, we had this big chemo-resistant, radio-resistant tumor. Uh, it was actually squeezing a patient and there was this poor oncology with no tools to try to push it up. Um, fortunately, uh, now things are, have been changed a little bit. So now we, have, we can actually harness the immune system with several molecules, with immunotherapy, but also with the neurogenic select inducers. And there's no such thing like an oncologist anymore. Now there's some immunologists that are trying to uh, remove these big tumors from patients. Actually, for those of you who were most attentive to the, to the studio, they would say, where is the patient? And the patient is actually have something better to do uh, now. So I will end this up. Uh, first of all, as you probably understand, I didn't do anything of this experimental work. So this work was done mainly by Eric and Federico, the, the uh, ATP part, the autophagy part. Um, Isabel is a local postdoc from the lab, um, who also has been doing a lot of part of this work. Uh, and of course, I, I have to mention, uh, to acknowledge, uh, my mentor and friend, uh, the man who needs no introduction. So I'm ready to take questions. Uh, thank you very much. Well, uh, uh, Lawrence.
the mutation of that gene happen earlier, the mutation of the other gene happen later. Happen later. Uh, for instance, ARAS or ATCB, I mean, that was the, the genes that were being investigated. The point is, this was for, the, for a majority of tumors, not for all tumors, meaning that, yes, this is maybe a preferred way for that tumor to arise, but it is not the only one. And the second is, in many other systems, like the land system, this thing could not, was not, uh, couldn't get any preferential way. So, what happened first, we don't know. We, we don't know whether the cells first stop dying or first they acquire a proliferative advantage. Of course, both of them are required to get rid of the uh, microenvironmental control uh, and generate an over tumor. So thank you for this really nice presentation. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm an immunologist and uh, <laughs> I'm very curious about uh, your protection uh, achievement with this, uh, using the cells. Uh, do you have a general idea how is the mechanism of this protection? Is is most of caused by the T cells uh, in this region? Are are the B cells also involved in this? The B cells are producing antibodies against these metabolites. Yeah, we have, uh, as I mentioned, well, I couldn't uh, show you all the data because it's 10 years of the investigation and many, many uh, papers, some of them kind of big papers. We, the general model that we have is that you need uh, CD4, no, well, sorry, uh, yeah, CD4 cells, uh, K1 CD4 cells, you need uh, gamma delta T cells that comes in before alpha beta T cells, so you need the production of the leukin 17, you need the production of the leukin 1 beta, you need from CD8 cells interferon gamma, but you don't need granzyme and perforin in our hands. And one of the nicest, nicest part of the story that in our hands, you don't need lymph nodes. So in our hands, antigen presentation works in tertiary lymphoid structures that are generated within the tumors. So we have lymphoid optimized mice and we still could see the vaccination effect. So we don't need an ABC to recirculate to the lymph nodes and prime the response in lymph nodes, priming occurs locally. And um, we don't need macrophages, and we don't need any data. And we don't need these cells. Okay. There's no humoral, we, do, we never measured any type of humoral immunity that wouldn't be something very late, probably based on the well, post T cell activity. So when T cells were very active, so you get uh, the, the response, then of course, some humoral, uh, we could measure some humoral response, but they were totally uh, not required for the vaccination. Or like an epic phenomenon. Okay. So, uh, just two curiosities. So the first one is, uh, are you studying the name of antigens uh, in this particular uh, concerning this ER stress response of the of activate any antigens? And the second one is. Uh, uh, what are you, what are your criticism in concerning the immuno, immunotherapy in particular? What is your opinion about uh, the subclonality or the, the potential resistance, etc.? Yeah. Uh, first question. Thanks. Thanks for the two very important points. Uh, I didn't mention it at all. Here we are using cancer cells. Okay, meaning that if you, uh, and, and as you surely know, immunogenicity comes from two things. Adjuventicity, and we have it with dance and antigenicity. So, if in this case we have antigenicity because these cells are uh, express a lot of neoantigen, even though we will never, uh, we, we were never interested, I don't know why, to really go and define what were the neoantigens. Um, of course, also for technical reasons, in a way, I mean, it's not so easy to identify the target of a new response unless you think it. For instance, when we did that with B16 OVA cells, we could sometimes find uh, OVA specific T cells, but not in all the experiments. Meaning that there's no one, one such thing like a single new antigen driving the response, or may, uh, and there's a kind of a big deal of antigen spreading in this condition. And second thing, criticism, of course, uh, last year we had witnessed in the immunotherapy field like a, at least four in, between nature, science, theory, and internal papers going and studying why many of these patients are not responding to immunotherapy. But uh, immunotherapy with checkpoint blockers. These checkpoint blockers have been a revolution because they have been very efficient 
against cancers that were really, really hard to treat beforehand, including the mass melanoma and now no small cell lung carcinoma. The point is that um, not like 50, less than 50% of the patients respond, and the idea behind that is that you need a high mutational load in your tumor, so you need a high epigenicity for these things to happen, uh, for this tumor to generate a new response, and for them to point blockers to work. And the, the, there is a real nice paper in science from, from um, Tom Schumacher, which is actually discussing these points, and there is this very nice picture in which he describes the uh, variation in antigenicity, the variation in mutational load in these tumors, and you can really see that the people who respond are those that are fast formulated. Of course, what can we do about it? Th that's the point. I mean, we have this problem, we have people responding to the point doctor, fine, and we have people not responding, what can we do? There are approaches to try to improve antigenicity. For instance, by simulating the uh, population of uh, MHC molecules, and so, you know, uh, uh, augment the visibility of the tumors of the immune system. Whether they will work in the clinic, I'm not sure. I mean, this is my data and uh, not so convincing to my personal and humble opinion, but we will see. <laughs> So partly to, to follow on this, so those checkpoint inhibitors mostly they, 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 they target the P1, PJ1, which is actually targeting the exhaustion, exhausted T cells. So they do not take into account uh, other ways uh, to uh, improve T cell functions. For example, T cells that are not exhausted but are in a more senescent stage. So maybe your your, your tumor specific cells not exhausted, but they are more on the senescent stage, right? We don't know. So this is just to put on this. The second thing is that although you try to go away from the pure immune, uh, let's say, approach for, for cancer, it always comes back in your slides. And when you don't have the immune cells, you don't see the effect that you oh. have, some, right? So my question is also referred to the first point. For those people that don't respond to those treatments, do you think that your approach could be a combined approach for 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 for, you know, for, for treatment, uh, or it's uh, how would you evaluate the, the, the capacity of your approach in clinical setting? Uh, no, I don't think that our approach would work on people not responding to checkpoint blockers at, at all, because I think that's a matter of antigenicity, and we don't we are not targeting antigenicity at all. I think that our approach will work in this situation in which. You have a, a chemotherapy that has been used for years and it is not sufficiently immunogenic. So you want to change this, this immunogenicity of chemotherapy. So theoretically, I mean as a first aid, direct aid you have gemcitabine. It's been used for decades in pancreatic cancer treatment, not, not induced immunogenicity of that. So maybe if you give to this patient something else that is boosting the immunogenicity, then you get a response. Uh, a better response because you know pancreatic adrenal carcinoma how bad it is and how, how patients are not responding to standard treatment. Um, so we are not really uh, trying to ameliorate immunotherapy. That's the point. We are trying to ameliorate how chemotherapy and radiotherapy activate the immune system, which is two different stories. And another thing is, I mean, if we limit up and the volume of Rolisma, all these PD1 CT out of four targeting agents are wonderful, but cost $100,000 per treatment. Here we are playing with chemotherapeutic agents and molecules that cost nothing as compared to these guys. So, we also should think about in which country we live and how is the social system and how much money we have to offer patients because of course, in some, uh, in some situations in which everybody pays for their own, uh, and if, if you want to get pembrolizumab, you will get it just because you pay, fantastic. But you should think when you are a country, whether you, you can give pembrolizumab, whether if you give pembrolizumab to one person, how many other people are not getting something because you don't have enough money to do it. Question. Uh, uh, what is about the uh, heterogeneity of uh, cancer cells in the same tube as uh, mechanism of resistance? Yeah. The, 
the fact is, of course, that tumors are very, very heterogeneous at the subclonal level. I didn't, I had also a slide on that and I put it away. Um, this is very important for us because we, we, we believe that when you treat that, of course, when you treat somebody with a, a specific uh, chemotherapy or radiotherapy, the idea of everybody is, okay, every cell is responding the same way, which is not true. We know that. We know that theoretically, of course, nobody is big, well, somebody also measured it, but we know that it's not true. So it's really important to take that into consideration. For the variability uh, of the response, actually, for the moment, when we got the vaccination effect, we always got uh, an entire, I mean, no, no tumor growth, meaning that probably the cells that were, we were injecting were sufficiently um, immunogenic to get, uh, to get taken into, um, to get killed by the immune system. The, it's also come back to the antigen spreading. Of course, we have been trying to do monospecific agents to induce immune responses, no? Cancer vaccines, uh, PCR, modified T-cells, and this, most of the time, they don't work, because exactly for that reason. Cancer cells are very heterogeneous, they will be selected, maybe some of them will be killed, admitting that you can't trigger a new response because sometimes you can't even do that, but there will still be some cells going on. So we really believe that when, when immune uh, responses are killing the cancer, are early gay cancers, it's because we have a sufficient amount of antigen spreading. So the response is so polyclonal and polyvalent that it takes covers for the heterogeneity. Thank you, Lorenz and Melissa. Uh, it's hard to compare uh, uh, between patients because of the heterogeneity of cancer. What about compare uh, human and mice? <laughs> yeah, yes. I mean, it's, uh, it's impossible to compare human and mice. We all know that, but we have to work with, we have to work with models, and uh, that's why uh, we try to, uh, to be as similar to the clinical situation as we can, everybody loves. And then we, we move to the things. And we, this, we have a uh, significant hope for this uh, clinical trial I mentioned to show a proof of principle to go into a phase three uh, large clinical trials. Even though we know that it's gonna be complicated because all these big companies uh, that have the money to, uh, to uh, organize and plan clinical trials of this kind are not interested in making all colleges work back. They are interested in selling their own products and they want to do, you know, 